So you're thinking about trying a new character, but your friend says, whatever you do, it better not be a dumb Titan. Or maybe you already are a Titan. And your friend still says you're a crayon eating motherfucker. feel like saying just quit being a that's what i'm saying i used to be a hunter main for ages but you know what's more fun than being a stompy cape wearing hunter flying across the map say nothing in the comments i dare you learning something new that's what in fact there's a quote from joe rogan that's always stuck with me it's good to suck at things and try to get better at them like when you put yourself in a situation where you suck at something it's really good for you so i chose none other than jumping right into that box of crayons as a titan I've grown to love the bottom tree on both Striker and Sunbreaker and then middle tree Void. But today I'm going to share how you can dominate on a Titan while using bottom tree Striker as the example. This will apply in all types of PvP. If you're a brand new Titan, all the bases are going to be covered. If you feel like you're an expert Titan, I promise you you'll learn something from this, but feel free to share your thoughts below with others. Starting with the common attributes, beginning with the grenade. The flashbang is supposed to blind your enemy and sounds super great if, say, a super is pushing you and you want to blind them, but it actually sucks. Pulse is handy if you're playing a lot of other titans who keep standing behind their shields because it can be a very effective method at suppressing that strategy. However, the playmaking ability of the lightning grenade is unreal. It sticks to surfaces you throw and extends a cone of damage outward perpendicularly. The cone size is, well, it actually kind of depends. I want you to picture a snow cone. At its max range through the center line, it's around 11 meters. The damage of the grenade scales based on how far they are, so at that max range, it'll do about 60 damage. But if they're just two meters closer along that center line, it'll actually hit for 150. Near the tip of that snow cone, the width of damage is around six meters. But within good range, that diameter becomes 10 meters, which means your enemy can be five meters away from where you throw it and still take damage. Thanks for the test, by the way, Jay. On that note, you guys, if you're looking for a group of people to play with, regardless of PvP or PvE, the Discord Discord is really starting to grow and it's been awesome chatting with everyone about stuff like this. The Discord link to join is in the description below. And heck, Jay just joined and he already put me to work with these grenade questions. All right, now how do I optimize the use of this grenade? Well, you basically have offensive and defensive. Offensive is when you intend to kill someone with it or do damage in order to finish them off afterwards. Defensive, on the other hand, is all about surviving. So let's talk about some examples. Number one, I can simply throw it in front of where someone is going. Against a basic player, this will likely do the trick for you. But against a better player, I like to take it one step further and commit myself to the opposite side during the play. That seems counterintuitive because you might think why not just go for the kill after the grenade hits them right well the reason is because a high level player is likely going to backpedal or shoot that grenade both of which are scenarios you need to be ready for the number one thing that good players do is stay in control of the play at all times and that's what you're doing here by preparing for their reaction method two is the same concept but throwing it behind them the two versions of this you need to think of are sideways and parallel in this example on burnout i get dozens of kills by throwing it on that left wall because they're typically standing right here by the heavy and they're challenging the east doorway. When they get shot and decide to disengage, they die by my grenade. Or if they decide to push forward, I'm ready for it because I've committed to that. Throwing it parallel is a little more tricky and you should probably just shoot someone with your gun if you can both see each other. But an example of this would be on dead cliffs whenever I'm being chased through the tunnel. I like to put the grenade right there as they're chasing through and then finish them off. Number three is on the ground. Similar to that dead clip situation, throwing it right in front of me on the ground as I backpedal is an excellent deterrent to someone rushing you, especially that stompy wearing hunter. Part of what you'll get used to is the pulse timing of your grenade too. It pulses one second after you hit the surface and then every two seconds from there. You'll naturally get the hang of throwing it on the ground and timing it for when that stompy jumping hunter is way above you. Now the last use I'll talk about is as a distraction. Here's an example where I throw my grenade and I know that they're going to be looking at it for at least a quarter of a second. Now I normally wouldn't suggest doing this because it's using up your grenade, but against excellent players, sometimes you need to do anything you can in order to gain control back of the play. So here I commit and I'm able to do just that. In all of these scenarios, you need to evaluate your situation and choose what to do based on whether you're being offensive or defensive. So try and think of it that way. And the more you play, the more it'll come to you. Finishing this section off is the fact that this grenade does enough damage damage to proc knockout, and then I can really get going with a chain kill using my dunes if I do get a tag, but more on that in a shield tactic later. Let's talk about the jump now, and I want you to remember this sentence. The point of your jump is to engage or disengage as effectively as possible with minimal vulnerability. Okay, fine, that was a little long. Here's the short version. Fast is your friend, risk is bad. 
let me just give you a quick crash course on the methods of jumping for a Titan. First, you have your initial hop like this. Then you're going to hit a bit of a boost and it's either going to send you up high, straight forward, or try and burst you kind of in between. Now, after that initial burst, you're going to have a couple of options. Option number one is to literally just let the glide run all the way till it's over and then land. Option two is you could hit another burst right here and you could go even higher or just keep going straight like that, but you get this extra little burst. And so with all of these jumps, I want you to think of these scenarios. There's the hop glide, there's the hop with multiple boosts, and then there's actually the micro boosting, which we're gonna get into. I'm gonna quickly show you footage for every scenario, but first let's start off with just the regular glide on high jump. You'll notice that I hop up and then I have this slow climb up to my maximum height. It's something that isn't necessarily special because I'm left in the air for a pretty long time and you're vulnerable when you're in the air. All you can do is try and kill your opponent before they kill you, except they can duck behind cover and you can't. Strafe jump, you're going to notice I hop up and then I kind of have this straight glide all the way across. And then catapult, after my first jump, you'll notice it skyrockets me up way, way, way higher than the rest. Now let's show you the boosting when you're just hitting jump as fast as you can. It's not yet with the mouse wheel and not with a macro. You'll notice the same thing here. High jump ends up kind of looking like this hopping thing like this. Strafe jump ends up being a lower version. And then catapult, of course, just ends up looking like this stupid thing like that. Now, what did I mean by micro boosting? Well, you see, this is PC specific and it's either when people are getting tired of hitting their space bar as fast as they can all the time, or they wanna try and get an advantage by shortening the time window from within each jump. They'll bind their mouse scroll wheel to jump so that all they need to do is just scroll that mouse wheel as fast as they can. And then that's instantly all of the activations for every single mouse wheel click that goes by. It's a heck of a lot easier and faster to do that. Then some people take it a step further and they actually build macros on their their mouse or their keyboard so all they have to do is hold one button and they'll time it perfectly to get the exact trajectory that they want catapult gives you a lot of velocity off your first hit and if you're hitting your boosts very very quickly using a macro or a mouse wheel you can end up getting some pretty good velocity heading in that direction now this used to be extremely strong a long time ago and they've nerfed it so right now i'm here to tell you that you can absolutely bind mouse scroll wheel to your jump and in fact i do do that but i do not run catapult to try and get that little extra oomph out of my jump i absolutely recommend running strafe lift in a lot of my videos you'll hear me say that consistency is king. Strafe lift is exactly that. You don't want to be floating up in the air for long periods of time. You want to just be going straight to your target, nice and low, parallel to the ground. You still have the ability to hover above a doorway if you need to. It gives you the best directional control and the most repeatability in PvP. Give it a shot and let me know what you think in the comments. And if you really want to go in depth on the mobility of a Titan around the jump, for example, I have a video at the top of the screen that you can check out or a link in the description called Titan Mobility. Next up is the barricade. It seems so simple, but there's so much to it. You get two options, short and tall. Although short has its uses in PvE, we're here for the crucible and you need to be using the tall one. Now its cooldown is relative to your resilience. Don't let that freak you out though. You don't need to be running max resilience. When I'm running two resilience, I typically wish I had it a little bit more, but then at three resilience, it's sufficient. I am a firm believer alongside consistent tournament winning player Vince that low resilience is still the play because it allows you to pump up all your other gear stats that are much more valuable. Or heck, looking at players such as Sonic and Panda who recently won the 2v2 tournament, they both did it with 2 and 3 resilience. Now they were on a Warlock and a Hunter, so I will say it sucks that the barricade is tied to resilience. If you feel like you're dying to a thorn a lot, then you should put on 6 resilience. Nothing else, okay? The resiliences in between are not beneficial in the long run. But getting back on track, the wall will last 20 seconds and you'll know it's about to disappear when the number of those snowflakes really starts to multiply. This is not to be confused with cracks though. Here's an example of me shooting an enemy barricade and you can see the same thing on your own, but as it takes damage, it gets more and more cracks. Earlier in the year, Bungie buffed the HP of these barricades from 500 to 600 HP, but at the same time, they made special weapons do more damage. But this actually isn't really that big of a deal and it didn't turn out to be a game changer because your opponents have to burn their special ammo to achieve 
achieve that, and as long as you're aware, you'll be fine. Now here's an example of what it can do. Take a look at this, where a titan is literally his dick's length away from me, and he still can't kill me because my barricade tanks the damage. And the best part about the shield is the fact that it's curved and it's not a straight wall. This comes in very handy, and we're going to talk more on that, plus some invisible portions of the wall after I go through some of the ways that I use it. The ways I use the shield are to survive, block a lane, gain information, or as a distraction. And shit, I'll add a fifth one called Omegalol. Now for survival, most new players will put it up preemptively knowing that they're going to take damage from some direction soon. But when I suggest using it for survival, it's mostly about buying time. You need to understand the relationship of your health and your barricade's animation time. Eventually you'll get the hang of this timing, and fortunately you get a little bit of damage resistance during it, but subconsciously you'll start to pop the shield early enough in order to stay alive mid-engagement which buys your brain some more time to think and react to what you need to do while your teammates are on their way to help you outside of surviving right in that instant i can lane block when i'm against an excellent sniper or a really bad snipe who's now looking for a new subscription to a perfect aim equivalent i'll use the animation's third person feature to gain information around a corner while simultaneously blocking that sniper's common hard scoping lane in scrim level play this actually tends to be one of the most useful methods because information is critical at that level when you go to do this you need to recognize the forward momentum that happens when you activate it please start using this to your advantage folks you don't need to be scummy and holding on to your third person sword view the entire game show us you got some big dick energy and save it for when you're using the shield Next up would be lane blocking. Now I'm gonna explain two types and one of them is similar to the survival example. For basic level play, this could be used in a doorway just to block your enemies from going there. And you'll know when they come through there because you'll get your hit markers. But similar to that survival scenario, your shield can also be used to remove a lane very quickly. And by cutting that lane, you're buying your team just enough time to commit to an angle and be the aggressor. Another hilarious example is when you block a lane right in front of you, AKA the enemy. This is not normally something that I would recommend, but if you happen to have a barricade between you you and an enemy you're staring at each other in the face it amazes me how often it can mess with your opponent's brain simply by having a wall there if you're smart with your movement you can strafe in and out of it and use the curvature to your advantage or hell you can even bait your opponent like these two examples here sorry brave i love you lastly is as a distraction sometimes i'll put it up just to steal my opponent's attention for a single moment when my team's about to push similar to the grenade you pop that shield it makes a sound i guarantee you there will be a half a second where everyone on the other team looks at that damn shield and you have an opportunity to regain control. Other times, I like to do it to waste their grenades. It's hilarious how often people will burn all their abilities on these things in that doorway in the beginning of Dead Clips. Oh yeah, the Omega Lull scenario. This thing does a metric shit ton of damage to the enemy. Too often do I one hit melee people because when they take damage from my shield, I have knockout so my extended melee will likely reach them all the way through the shield 10 football fields away and then reversal will get my health back so you can really start to make some plays with this. Hell, you can even do some damage through a wall. Don't worry, we're going to come back to curvature in my gameplay section at the end. Now, since we're using the bottom tree striker, here are the perks. Frontal Assault. Using a charged melee on someone reloads your weapon while activating extra stability and damage on it. The funny part is this isn't even the key to the class. This is just a bonus here and there. And the stability that comes with this is so much that you feel like you cannot miss a shot. And then the damage increase for someone like myself who mains a thorn is insane. When I have Devour and Frontal Assault proc, take a look at this 117 damage bullet. The next two are Reversal and Knockout. These things have incredible synergy together and do not require a charged melee. Basically, when you get into a fight with someone, if you break their shield, that will proc Knockout, which gives you the extended, stronger melee to kill them, and then Reversal will give you your health back when it happens. I touched on this moments ago, and at face value, punching doesn't sound great in a gun-based game, but Destiny is very CQC. The key here is developing confidence and knowing the limits of your character. As you play more of this class, you'll come to realize what procs this and what doesn't, so you can preemptively melee knowing that they're going to die. This allows you to be thinking three steps ahead because of it. Once I have knockout procced, all I have to do is hit someone with 150 RPM hand cannon body shot, and then I can melee them. Because the damage increase on the melee is from 100 to 160. If I happen to backpedal and shotgun someone from range, I don't have to worry about it because there's a really good chance my melee is going to teleport me all the way back to them. Why is that? Well, that's because the range is extended from 5.5 to 7 meters. Now, I'm going to come back to this because it's a bit of a slippery slope 
slope if you get too cocky. The best part of all of this is clutching 1v3s using reversal. When you get that extra damage melee off to finish someone, you start healing immediately. Like two frames in my editing software later, you start to get your health back and it will heal you in roughly two seconds, which is equivalent to 10 recovery. Obviously we like this, but it's also a nice bonus because your opponents don't often see it coming. It can be very disruptive mentally to be fighting someone and then all of a sudden their health resets. Now let's talk about the super. As you're likely aware, if you're holding W, which most people are, it'll jump forward. But make no mistake, letting go of W before popping can come in clutch since it goes straight down. A lot of enemies don't see this coming and it can guarantee you hit where you want, especially if a super's coming at you. During your animation time, they're still traveling closer to you. So by the time you hit the ground, if you just go straight down, they'll be right on you. I see a lot of novice titans actually missing their target because they jump behind the enemy who's coming at them. Once you're in the super, the right click is that same slam function, but the left click is similar to a shoulder charge. It lunges you in a straight line and one hits your opponent. With dunes, it'll also chain a ton of enemies nearby, and with Bungie's poor net code, sometimes this happens. The smash does 275 damage while the lunge does 205 damage. It's important to remember that because when you're fighting supers, they have a lot more than 200 health. So many titans die when they see a super coming at them because they all of a sudden think, aha, my crayon's bigger than yours. And then they right click and die when they smash. Well, let's say a super is coming at me. What I need to do is some chip damage with my shotgun. That'll bring their health down within the damage capability of my right click. Then I smash in order to ensure I secure the kill. You need to train yourself to be more patient with this. Sometimes I'll already be in a super and I can't do chip damage, right? Well, the good news is your Titan doesn't actually get stunned like the others with a melee attack. You need to left click and then immediately smash after. The unfortunate part about the super is the hit registration. You can often lose fights because while you're trying to get that left click to actually register, a spectral blade has already kicked your ass. It's a buzzkill for sure. Another rule is you don't need to get a kill with that initial pop. Far too often I see people put themselves in vulnerable positions just to try and get a kill with that initial right click. Don't forget, that's like the first 5% of your super. You can easily pop behind cover and then make your play. A skilled team will shred you in your initial animation if you're too aggressive. It is okay to be more defensive and hell, even popping it just to gain back map control in itself is okay. Now how about the movement in your super? You don't just have to sprint forward. Even though your left click burns super energy, we know that the bottom tree also gains a additional super every time you get a kill with it. So if it means you can close the gap quick enough and hit someone and get super energy back, it'll often be worth it. Just don't run in a straight line at someone because that's extremely easy to get sniped. Using a zigzag technique can be very effective for preventing a sniper doming you. Now do I just spam my left click? No. What you want to do is you want to hop, look up, then lunge. Hop, look up, lunge. Hop, look up, lunge. You'll get the hang of it as you practice a bit. And remember, against high skilled players, you need to try and predict what they're going to do. Feel free to bait a shotgun or another super by clicking towards them and then clicking back. They're likely not going to expect you to click back. So when you're doing that, you're already thinking about the next play. Are you going to right click? Are you going to left click back to them and smash? These are ways for you to stay in control. Now, the last part on this section, and you're going to get flamed for this, but fuck the haters you're struggling in trials when you get your super swap to the eternal warrior exotic this will give you an overshield in your super and a much nicer time reaching those seven wins in trials all right i've covered all of the aspects within the titans character build but let's talk about a few do's and don'ts and tips and tricks specific to gameplay outside of all of these segments that i broke down Starting with that first thing I said I would come back to, the shield curve. Don't worry, I didn't forget. Look at this right here. You get a tiny bit of extra invisible wall that will take damage. And on their perspective, they're shooting the edge of my hitbox, but for me, it's not. Crouching within this curved shield can cover a ridiculous amount of your hitbox. When someone's flying above you trying to shotgun you, it becomes very difficult for them to get all of the pellets necessary to hit you if you're tight to the wall like that. You can almost always outplay someone in this situation by simply using this to your advantage. Another thing you can do, let's say you're trying to survive while your teammates are on their way or you're capping the point at the end of trials, feel free to throw up your shield and a grenade above it to add further protection. And then you can really prevent someone from aping above you or you at least delay them. Oh, right. And if you stuck around this long, pro tip when you're throwing your grenade. If you hop before throwing your lightning grenade, you're going to have a lot more favorable results. And lastly, 
faking people out. Well, you can burn special by faking in and out like this. You can fake strafing out or fake poking forward, and you can often get rid of someone's shotgun or sniper ammo. Next up is something I like to call all or not. In sixes, you can pretty well go ham with Titan, but this subclass will crush you if you're indecisive. One of the best Titans in the world mentioned earlier, Vince, was often more of a support player in every tournament that they won. He was the coach, so to speak, and would use his character's skill sets to clutch up in moments where he might burn all of his abilities in one shot. The Titan character is very much all or not. Play smart, remember that all of those abilities can be burnt when you need to clutch up, and that your knockout and reversal combo doesn't need a charged melee. The difference between con confidence and cocky. Playing bad players for a long time makes you feel invincible on a shotgun, but as a result, you can learn very bad habits because you end up doing this thing called resulting. You keep making bad decisions, but you get a good result because of your poor opponent. On a Titan, this tends to be over rushing. At a competitive level, these dominant CQC traits become more important in a defensive or a clutch scenario than they do in an offensive scenario. A good example is the aping shotgun melee, right? If you were truly elite, your shotgun would one hit them and you wouldn't need that melee to finish them off. You'll find the higher you go in skill, the more you realize your melee's effectiveness in a passive sense instead of an aggressive sense, like when you don't have time to pull out that shotgun. And this is a good segue into holding your primary out. If you force yourself to hold your primary out more often, it'll teach you to use your shotgun more defensively and realize how important backpedaling is. So keep that in mind, even though you're having a blast shredding through people in sixes with a shotgun melee. Up next is knowing your exotic. One-Eyed Mask and Synthos are two amazing exotics that go with the Titan, but I hold the Dune Marchers close to my heart and there's a picture and link above if you want to learn all about those over sliding. This isn't really particular to a Titan, but I want to mention two things. Don't over slide all the time. If you're sliding around a corner, you want to ADS slide, which is another tactic I'm going to go through someday, but don't slide out so far that you just end up dying. You need to be able to backpedal behind cover and then practice backsliding. I know this is really hard for people on a controller, but if you're on mouse and keyboard, backsliding can be super valuable. The last tip I'll bring up in this video is looking down when you're in the air. I mentioned that being low to the ground is always good for a Titan, but sometimes you end up in the air and if you see a sniper, it's not necessarily over. It is worth it to look down. Whip that head of yours backwards and down, and it makes it a lot harder for them to hit the snipe. So now that you know what items to pick on Titan, what tree you might want to play on Titan, the exotic you want to use on Titan, what about your stat distribution? Well, mobility, you want between three and seven. I prefer five or six though, and here's why. Technically, low mobility can help with that burst movement I was talking about, but I don't like that I feel really slow with my strafe speed. Five and six gives me good, consistent strafe speed that I can easily play on all the other characters. For example, if I was going to run three on a Titan, I would never want to go and run three on a Hunter. Additionally, the initial hop gets pretty high after seven, so I like to keep it somewhere in the middle. Resilience. Well, we've already talked about that, but usually I'm aiming for a round three for the shield cooldown, and then six if there's a bunch of thorns. Recovery, you need a hundred. If you need to know why that's so important, let me know in the comments and I'll do a video on it. Grenade energy. You need lots of it. I used to run five thinking that was great. Then I bumped it up to six. Then I bumped it up to seven. Now I like to even run eight if I can. Grenades are so insanely clutch in this game that I recommend six as a minimum. I have a really unique method on how you can figure out how much grenade or melee energy you need by using a very simple tactic when doing a VOD review. If you're curious, look up the gear stats link in the description or click on the link above. When it comes to intellect, you need at least three. I could also go down the rabbit hole there or point you to another video of mine about cooldown interpretations, but basically you need between three and seven. And after seven, you are wasting your time. I personally aim for six or seven. Last but not least is strength. Oddly enough, this one is completely counterintuitive. As a melee class, you would think that you need a lot of strength, but remember, frontal assault is the only thing here that requires a melee. So yeah, sure, if you want to have frontal assault all the time, you could pump up your melee as high as you can, but that will end up crushing all of the other stats across your character that are more crucial to this sub class. I literally run either two or four. Woo! That was a doozy. Oh wait, I have another pop quiz and this one's for you Titan experts. Tell me how you can do these two things. As I mentioned before, if you want to join in and play games or do testing with all of us, the link to the Discord is down below. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing so that you can catch my next ones. And if you really want to make sure you see them, because apparently YouTube hides these things from sub inboxes sometimes, you got to actually turn on that notification bell. Any feedback on how you like to play Titan, be sure to let us all know in the comments so we can have a discussion going. And if you want to support the growth of the channel, dropping a like is always a really good way to do that. Last but not least, if you've never heard of the Ashen Wake build, you can get a super in 60 seconds flat. The thumbnail on the 
the top right hand corner is exactly that while the one in the bottom right hand corner is what youtube thinks that you would like so that's it for now hope you guys have a great day